September 11th, 2001. The sky over New York that morning was crystal clear. In a matter of minutes, the city would be enveloped in a cloud of terror on what would become one of the darkest days in the history of the United States. Foreign-born terrorists bent on the murder of Americans and the destruction of the country hijacked four U.S. commercial jetliners and turned them into weapons of mass destruction, taking down the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and tearing open the Pentagon. More than 3,000 innocent people were killed, many others wounded. This is the story of the attack on America, the horror, and the heroes. This is what we saw. It's 8.52 here in New York. I'm Brian Gumble. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. We don't know if it was a commercial aircraft. We don't know if it was a private aircraft. We have no idea how many were on board or what, is th what the extent of the injuries are right now. We are. Uh, we have. I understand an eyewitness on the phone right now, sir. Sir, good morning. This is Bryant Gumbel. Could you tell it? Could you give us your name? Yeah, my name is Stuart. Stuart, where are you right now? I'm working at a restaurant in Soho. All right. So tell us what you saw, if you would. I literally. I was waiting at a table, and I literally saw a. It seemed to be like a small plane. I just heard a couple noises. It looked like it like bounced off the building, and then I heard a. I just saw a huge, like ball of fire on top, and then the smoke seemed to simmer down. And it just, um, you know, a lot of smoke was coming out, and that's pretty much the extent of what I saw. Can you tell us about the scene down there right now? Um, right now, people are just on the street looking at the building. The building, it was just a lot of smoke. Um, it's not too crazy down where I am. How, but, um, how far away from the World Trade Center specifically are you? I'm actually on Thompson Street North. It's, I'm not too, too far. It's 8.54 right now, Stuart. Can you tell me when this happened exactly? I would have to say about 10 minutes ago. Were you looking up as the plane approached the building, or did, you, did it only call your, catch your attention after it, uh, it crashed into the World Trade Center? I heard uh, like a sort of a crashing sound, but I looked up, and I looked up quick enough to actually see something go into the building, but everything happened so fast I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. So there's no way you can know whether or not the plane seemed to be in trouble before, no, no. before it crashed into the building. Oh, no, I, I, no, I couldn't tell. It's, it's hard for us to tell um, from the picture we're seeing just uh, how far down from the top that plane crashed. Um, have you any better eyesight to it um, from your vantage point? Not really. All I know is it definitely wasn't the top, top of the building because that seems to be intact from what I saw. Obviously, um, the, uh, the timing of this is, is important. Um, it comes before 9 o'clock. Um, perhaps, perhaps, and, and, and we say that in hopeful fashion, perhaps not everybody was at work um, because uh, if, if that building was in fact crowded with, uh, with workers, we're looking at, uh, at, at probably some, uh, some casualties and, and, and injuries of, of considerable proportions, but, uh, but right now there's, there's no way of telling that. We're on the line with um, uh, another eyewitness. Um, sir, this is Bryant Gumbel in New York. Hey, how um, you doing? I'm fine, thank you. You're Wendell? Yes, I am. Wendell, can you give me your last name? Klein. Wendell Klein. Um, tell me where you are, if you would. Well, right now I'm in the back in the hotel. I'm in the hotel offices here, the front office. You're in the, okay, where were you when the... When uh, the I, I was standing right in front of the trade, um, the hotel. I'm the doorman there. And... Um, the Excellent. hotel, the hotel, which hotel? Marriott World Trade Center. Right across from the World Trade Center. It's actually right in between. Them. Right in between the World Trade Center. Yes. Okay, so you were standing outside, and tell us what you saw and what you heard. Well, well what I, I heard first, an explosion, and I just figured that it was a plane passing by. Then all of a sudden, stuff just started falling, like bricks and paper and everything. And so I just kind of like ran like inside to get away from the falling debris and glass and so forth. Then after like everything stopped because it like was falling in the street and the cars were crashing into each other and then when it kind of stopped i heard a guy screaming and when i looked over there was this guy that was on fire so i kind of like ran over and i tried to like put the fire out on him and he was he was like screaming and i just told him to roll roll and he said he can't 
And then another guy came over with his uh, bag and kind of like put the, fl- the flames out on him. So right now um, he's being taken care of. I just had everyone call the ambulance and stuff so they can help him out. He caught fire as a result of the falling debris? Yeah. Um, how much debris, can you give us an idea of how much came oh, crashing man. to the ground? It's just a lot. Um, bricks, a lot of bricks, a lot of glass. Um, I'm like enough to like damage cars on the street, make cars swerve into each other, that kind of thing. I hear alarms going off down yeah, there. What, what's, what's happening? That's our hotel alarm, and basically, I guess that went off automatically. They've evacuated everyone in the hotel, and evacuated all employees. I they have of. evacuated the hotel? Yes. Immediately? Yes. Are you hearing anything, Wendell, about what kind of a plane it was no. or, or no. how many were on board? No. All right. Mr. Klein, thank you very much, sir. I understand Teresa Renault is with us right now. Ms. Renault, good morning. Good morning. How this are is, you? This is Bryant Gumbel. I'm down on uh, 59th and 5th. Where are you? I am in Chelsea, and we are at 8th and 16th. We are the tallest building in the area, and we, my window faces south. Uh, so it looks directly onto the World Trade Center. And I would say, you know, approximately 10 minutes ago, there was a major explosion from probably, uh, it looks like about the 80th floor. It looks like it's affected probably four to eight floors. Uh, major flames are coming out of the, let's see, the north side and also the east side of the building, yes. And it was very loud explosion followed by flames, and it looks like the building is still on fire on the inside. Um, which building are we talking about, the one that's westernmost? Um, let's see. Yes, sir. Did you hear the explosion oh, from yes. your position? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we, we heard it, and because and, I was just like standing there pretty much looking out the window, I didn't see what caused it or if there was an impact. So you have no idea right, right oh, now? Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> Right. Oh, oh my God! Oh. Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Oh. Flew right into the middle of it. Oh. Explosion! Oh my right, God! It's right in the middle of the building. This one into the east tower. Yes, yes, right in the middle of the building. And right now, that yes, that was definitely looked like it was on purpose. You saw a yes, plane. Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. Why do you say that was definitely on purpose? It, because it just it just flew straight into it. It looks like it's about, uh, I would say, 15 floors lower than the first building. And there's now flames coming out of that building as well. They're both completely on fire. Now, Teresa, hang on with us one second. We're going uh, to re-rack the tape of when we were talking to you to see if we can tell. Okay. Um, we can't see anything. We can't see a second plane in the picture. There we see the explosion. Two commercial jetliners turned into missiles blast through the twin towers of the World Trade Center, 17 minutes apart. It is clear now this was no accident. America is under attack. Minutes later, the terrorist hijackers strike again at the very heart of America's military might. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington, and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. It would appear that there has been another major explosion, this one in the nation's capital. You are looking at a scene of uh, apparent blast aftermath. There is smoke in the air over the Pentagon. We don't know whether this is the result of a bomb or whether it is yet another aircraft that has targeted a uh, symbol of the United States power, but there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. Um, this is coming at 9.43 Eastern Time. The president right now is on his way back from Florida. He had gone there for an educational event. In a brief remarks, he said this was an apparent terrorist attack on our country. We do have a couple of reports, one from AP, one from Reuters, reporting that an American Airlines plane was hijacked, that a United Airlines plane was hijacked, supposedly one of those two planes hijacked out of Boston. At this point, the Pentagon, the White House, the Capitol, and the Treasury have been evacuated in uh, Washington. In New York, all airports, tunnels, and bridges have been closed, and in Chicago, the uh, Sears Tower has been evacuated. We understand now there has been a secondary explosion on Tower 2. With that, we will leave you and turn it over to Dan Rather. This is CBS News continuing live coverage of the wow. apparent terrorist attacks today here in New York City 
and in Washington, D.C. It's important to say these things at the very beginning. There is much that is not known about what is happening. The second thing is that the word from almost everybody who's trying to deal with the situation, the word of the day is steady, steady. Yes, there have been some terrible things happening, but until and unless we know the facts, it's very difficult to draw many conclusions. But there'll be rumors all day, and we're going to try to separate the rumors from the facts. CBS News veteran correspondent Harold Dow is on the telephone now uh, from uh, a section of the city where these twin towers are in flames and smoke. Harold, if you hear us, come in. I arrived on the scene about an hour and a half ago, and uh, believe it or not, there was another major explosion. The, build, the building itself, literally the top of it, came down, sending smoke and debris everywhere. I had to do all I could to run to get away from all the debris. Me and a number of other people here are trapped in the subway here in a shoe store, actually trying to get away from most of the debris. Uh, it's just an incredible sight. They had a lot of emergency workers around the building, and of course everybody's hoping that these people were able to get out of there without being injured. But it is a surreal and devastating scene over here, something like I've never seen before. Harold, exactly where are you in filing this report? Uh, Dan, I'm at a subway station. I just ran down the stairs. I didn't even look at it. It's right around the corner from the World Trade Center. And I'm kind of waiting for that smoke and debris to blow away to go back upstairs. But it's uh, just an unbelievable situation here. Well, Harold, if I may, uh, take a deep breath, take a series of deep breaths. And then let me ask you, uh, have you seen any indication that would tend to confirm these uh, reports which have been growing in intensity that a section of the World Trade Center uh, has collapsed onto the street below. Do you see any confirmation of that in that any direction? That is true, Dan. That's what we were all running from. We heard the building coming down, and that's what we were running from. Literally, people ran out of their shoes trying to get out of the way of this thing. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed just before 10 a.m. The North Tower, a half hour later. The most powerful nation on earth was shaken to its very foundation. The capital was in chaos. These pictures have to do with casualties injured at the Pentagon. If anybody has been killed, we are not yet aware of it. We go to Jim Stewart in our Washington bureau. Jim. And here in uh, Washington, uh, the police now have closed down the Capitol, the House and Senate. They have closed down the Justice Department. The World Bank has been emptied. Uh, we are told that the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington now is on full alert with the anticipation that there could be additional targets if in fact someone is targeting uh, sites in the nation's capital. Uh, we are told that the FAA has grounded all flights, all domestic flights in the United States. One building that has not closed down is the FBI. The FBI has established an emergency command post. Uh, in the center of its building. It's a, a contained area that is presumably safe from bombs, they believe, and uh, FBI officials have been there now for the last two hours trying to sort out exactly uh, what is going on. I can tell you, Dan, that the uh, working uh, theory here is that this is the work of terrorists. They specifically believe this is the work of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, leader of the international terror network known as Al-Qaeda, was about to become the main target of a U.S. war on terrorism. But for the moment, the U.S. military was dealing with a more immediate crisis. The Pentagon was on fire. Even the Secretary of Defense was helping to carry the wounded to safety. In Washington, we go to David Martin on cell phone. David? I'm at uh, Arlington National Cemetery, which is just across the highway from the uh, Pentagon. A portion of the west side of the uh, Pentagon has collapsed. Um, I spoke to one of uh, many injured who uh, were in the building at the time. He had a light uh, head wound. I asked him what happened. He said he didn't know, but as, as he was leaving the building, he asked a security guard, what hit us? And the security guard said, a plane. And you can see pieces of uh, twisted fuselage uh, lying about um, 50 yards away from uh, the building of the Pentagon. Right now, the this, this scene is uh, one of, of black smoke and uh, dozens of fire engines, uh, uh, medevac helicopters. They are rigging that part of the lawn of the Pentagon, which is where the uh, helipad that the Secretary of Defense uses is located. They are rigging that uh, to handle 
uh, mass casualties. Uh, they're bringing in uh, large numbers of stretchers uh, to deal with this. Um, this uh, all appearances are that for the uh, first time in its 50-plus year history, the Pentagon has been attacked. Nearly 200 people died in the attack on the Pentagon, more than 2,800 at the World Trade Center. As the Twin Towers collapsed, people on the street ran for their lives, including CBS News correspondent Carol Marine. She was still covered in debris as she told how she narrowly escaped death. Dan, I think I was in the second collapse or uh, an explosion right after that because I was trying to make my way around Stuyvesant High School. I believe that's correct. I'm not a New Yorker. But I was coming um, toward the World Trade Center looking for CBS crews and asked a firefighter if I, he saw any. He told me to walk down the middle of the road. All of a sudden, there was a roll, an explosion, and we could see coming at us a ball of flame stories high. He and others screamed, run, and I ran. Uh, I fell. One of them picked me up. We ran as fast as we could, and then he threw me into the wall of a building and covered me. Forgive me. I am, in his, I am in his debt. You know, Dan, I know firefighters do incredible work all of the time, but this was exceeded anything that I can imagine. He threw me into a wall, covered me with his body. Uh, I could feel his heart banging against my back. We were both so sure we were going to die. The flame somehow stopped short of us. But whatever collapsed created, and you saw it in some of that video, Dan, a rain of cinders so thick that you couldn't see this far in front of you and you couldn't breathe. A police officer, and I wish I knew the firefighter's name, a police officer by the name of Brendan Duke grabbed my hand and he and I tried to find our way through it until we could hit a clearing in the light. What you're seeing on the ground here, Dan, was in the air and, um, and you couldn't see. And again, we thought we were finished. We somehow got to the light Another firefighter gave me his mask for a moment so I could breathe. And then I made my way somehow through the smoke into the light to our crews. Um, there was a cameraman there whose head was bloody and he was trying to shoot and set up some of these shots there. Um, the firefighters, the police, the crews, the people. People streamed toward me as I made my way to the Trade Center, sobbing and crying and trying to call home on dead cell phones, but they couldn't get through. Um, there is so much fear out there even now because of gas main leaks. There was a point at which I watched firefighters run. Someone threw me forward. Um, a paramedic truck let me jump inside and drove me halfway. And then a New York City bus driver opened his doors of an empty bus and drove me here to the broadcast center. Um, to all of them, I mean, citizens of New York and, and uh, have remained amazingly calm but deeply frightened. No one knew if or when terrorists would strike again or where. Immediate steps were taken to preserve the continuity of the U.S. government. The president and the vice president, the leaders of Congress, were rushed to secure locations. The government was in crisis. The Pentagon, the heart and soul of the U.S. Defense Department, headquarters of the U.S. Defense Department has never been attacked before. A portion of it is now in flames. We go to Bob Schieffer, our chief Washington correspondent. Bob. Well, Dan, to give you some sense of just how big that explosion was, I'm about a block north of the White House, some miles from the Pentagon, but as you look over my shoulder and look directly across the old executive office building, you can see there are still these huge clouds of smoke billowing out of the Pentagon. This was no small explosion. It can be seen literally for miles. Dan, I must say, if there is one thing you can say for America and the American people, they come together in times of crisis like this. Just now, we got a joint statement from the Republican and Democratic leaders uh, in the Congress. I want to read to you what they said. They said, quote, and this is Tom Daschle and Trent Lott, speaking in one voice today, not two voices, speaking in one voice. They say, we are outraged at this cowardly attack. Our prayers are with the families of the victims. We are strongly behind the president. 
the full resources of the United States government will be brought to bear to protect the American people, and perhaps the most important part of this, and to punish, to track down and punish the perpetrators of this attack. This is being seen on Capitol Hill as another Pearl Harbor. John Warner, the uh, ranking Republican on the Armed Services Committee, said just that. Chuck Hagel, another, another very uh, influential senator on defense matters, said today, America has been forever changed. Osama bin Laden had tried once before to destroy the World Trade Center in 1993. So when it was attacked again, he immediately became the prime suspect. But who was this mysterious figure? Professor Fuad Ajami, a Middle East expert, knew well bin Laden's trail of terror and his motives. We do know that Osama bin Laden has been active in this kind of industry of terror. He's a wholesaler of terror. And we do know that uh, in the East Africa bombings of both Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, he was implicated. We suspect that he was implicated on the attack on the USS Cole, where two of his followers, we think, in effect, hit one of our destroyers. And so we have arrived at this uh, point now. We do know that it's the fate of a liberal power like us, like this, this great superpower, uh, to be envied, to be resented, and look at this attack. This attack targets the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. It targets our, the, the symbol of our military might and the symbol of our financial e economic might. So both New York and Washington are the main targets. And it is a message to a great power that even though our wingspan is broad, even though our economic resources are vast, even though our military uh, infrastructure, our military might is vast, we are vulnerable to these kinds of operations. And we do know that there is tremendous amount of anti-Americanism in large parts of the world. In large parts of the world, there's tremendous amount of anti-Americanism. In the world of Islam in particular, we understand this. But there is this anti-Americanism, and people like bin Laden feed off it. By the evening of September 11th, President Bush was already planning a war against the terrorists, as the nation was still absorbing the horror of what these murderers had done. In New York, thousands were dead. CBS News correspondent Byron Pitts gave the first full account of the horror of that day, the end of the World Trade Center, and what looked for a time like the end of the world itself. Dan, without exaggeration, this part of Manhattan looks like a battlefield. We have seen blood. We have seen body parts. We have watched people die in front of our eyes. This was terrorism like we in America have never seen before. 8.48 a.m., mayhem in Manhattan. We saw a plane coming very low, and everyone said, wow, that plane is very, very low. Come on, guys, keep moving. I was walking to work, and all of a sudden, I see a jet crash into the first tower. An American Airlines flight loaded with 92 people crashes head on into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And then we heard the crash. We ran to the window. Into the building. It went into the Trade and Center. The Trade Center, we, we saw the out. shrapnel fall, and then we said, get out. And minutes later. Right oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> right. Oh, oh my God. Oh. Another plane has just hit. I heard a roar, and I looked around thinking that it had to be a helicopter, and I looked up, and I saw the second plane hit. A second commercial plane, a United Airlines jet, also hijacked, carrying 65 people, plows into the South Tower. First one, we thought was an accident. When we heard there was a second one, we definitely thought it was terrorism. On the ground, witnesses could not believe their eyes. <laughs> 70 stories up with the building burning. Reason gave way to desperation. New York's bravest never had a chance. We really never even got to the, uh, cl that close to the building. The explosion blew and it, it knocked everybody over. Less than an hour later, the South Tower came crumbling down. It collapsed. The top floors collapsed down. I saw it brought blow and then ran like hell. Thank God I'm 69, but I can still run. <laughs> but it was far from over. Now, Tower 2 collapsed into Tower 1. Ten minutes after that, we were ordered out. When the dust settled, signs of life started to emerge. Chaos. It's just chaos out here. It really is. So the Twin Towers fall. It's amazing. It's crazy. I can't believe this shit is happening. I really can't. It's nightmares. It's Armageddon right here. This was the worst act of terrorism on U.S. soil. 
but not the first attack on the World Trade Center. Eight years ago, terrorists set off bombs in the basement in an effort to take down the two towers. They failed. Today, mission accomplished. I tell you what, it's a sad day for America, it really is. By 2 o'clock this afternoon, firefighters and police officers and paramedics by the hundreds stood by, many of them feeling helpless. There was nothing they could do at this point because the building was still unsecure. Our main priority is to get in, do a search and rescue, look for survivors, and then clean up uh, what's left. Uh, and we can't do that until the building is deemed safe. Ankle deep in debris and despair, rescue workers waited. Some had relatives of their own inside. One police officer told me her sister worked here on the 40th floor, due in at 9 a.m. She was always early, she said, always. A sign on a paramedic's van spoke volumes. We're gonna do the best that we can to get people out of there, get into the hospital, get back in line, go back out there and do it again. New York Port Authority Police Chief William Hall choked back tears. For him, this was no longer just work. On a personal level, because I know that these are all your men and it's, it's a business, but I'm sure that a lot of these guys are your friends. How you help them? It's a business now. It's personal now. Sir? It's personal now. We have to get them. Back live, we have had little relief here. Take a look at this. About an hour ago, World Trade Center building number seven collapsed. A 42-story building, weakened by the devastation that had occurred earlier today. No word any casualties in the building. It was the one calamity that was not a surprise. Police had evacuated the area hours ago, fearful building number seven would indeed fall down. This morning when tower, the first tower collapsed, I was standing about three blocks away with CBS News correspondent Mika Brzezinski. As the fireball rolled toward us, Mika grabbed her shoes, I grabbed her hand, and we ran like hell. Thousands did. Dan, except for a few sirens, I have never heard New York City this quiet. Graveyard quiet. It is September 12th, 24 hours since the terrorist attack on America. In New York, the desperate search for survivors goes on. But reality is quickly sinking in. How could anyone be alive in that burning pile under tons of shattered concrete and twisted steel? It was now called ground zero and CBS News correspondent Scott Pelley was there. We spent much of this day at the foot of the World Trade Center towers or what's left of the World Trade Center towers. We were there with the rescue workers who were searching for any sign of life but by late today even for them hope was beginning to give way to the grim realities of this attack. Ground zero right between the remnants of the two shattered towers. Late today, a body wrapped in the American flag was pulled from the wreckage. It was believed to be that of a New York City firefighter, one of perhaps hundreds who were caught in the collapse of the towers as they themselves were struggling to save the victims of the attack. In this plaza, once a crossroads of the world, hundreds of firemen, doctors, paramedics pulled at the mountain of debris, shoulder to shoulder with average New Yorkers, iron workers, carpenters, nurses, all volunteers. John Steele is a volunteer nurse who hoped to make miracles here, but there have been precious few of those. You pulled two people out of here. Tell me about that. Uh, Approximately 5 o'clock this morning, the sun wasn't really quite up yet. Uh, we located one victim. Uh, Alive? No. No. Unfortunately, deceased. Um, what was remaining of the victim, I should say. Um, and shortly after that, we uh, located another victim of the tragedy, uh, also deceased. We were able to retrieve that victim's body also and bring it to the morgue. Can you describe these people to me? Uh, 
physically I really can't because fortunately there wasn't really much left of them. You've been all over this place where we are, ground zero for 18 hours. What are the chances? What are the chances that there's somebody alive, do you think? Well, uh, to be honest with you, we did uh, retrieve a, a police officer this morning who was trapped for approximately 11 hours last night. Uh, from what I understand, I can't confirm this is true or not, apparently he was on the 80th floor. That rescued officer was treated by Dr. Tony Daher. He and his partner, Dr. Lincoln Cleveland, are emergency room physicians from New York University Hospital downtown. I was here when they extricated the police officer at 8 o'clock this morning, who was in very good shape, actually, amazingly enough. Um, I think right now it's just going to be a very slow process of digging through rubble. We, we saw all our casualties yesterday at our hospital stopped at about noon. It got really strange and very spooky. It just it, Things just stopped coming in that had anything to do with the, with the blast. And, you know, at the time, I was thinking, you, you can read a couple things into that. Either people are buried and they're going to start bringing bodies out or just everybody died. Where are all the people who were in these buildings? The buildings were built, the structural support of the building is the shell, is the skin of the building. I remember when they were built, I'm a New Yorker. The innovative architecture, architecture of it is that the, the outer shell is where the strength of it is. And I think what happened is the whole thing imploded. It was like a chute that went straight down. What does that mean to the inside? It means that the explosion has nowhere to go except down. Um, I think another building collapses, there's toppling, pieces fall off, there's a diffusion of the energy, and in this collapse, the energy all went straight down. And I think that, tragically, it, anybody in that chute it did not survive. I think it probably had the force of close to a nuclear blast. These firemen from Brooklyn have been taking the mountain down piece by piece, and many of them share the pessimism of the doctors. It's what? It's just huge rubble. Do you, do you see anything of the victims, of the people who were in the building? Yeah, you've got 110 stories on top of uh, everybody over there. It's, it's just tough to say. 110 you know, stories on top of everybody. That's what, that's what the two buildings were. Everybody's working together, yeah. you know, the whole city, and trying to get people out. Get how do you how do you dig this up? Piece by piece. Hand by hand. That's why you just make the chains and uh, get the debris out. That's, that's all you can do. 110 stories at ground level. 110 stories of ground level. Mm -hmm. We got a shot you see the antenna that was on top of the tower. It's at ground right level. This way. And yet there are no people to be seen. Well, they pulled out a couple of Port Authority cops alive. Last night, right? Last night? Last night, this morning. Supposedly they were like on the 80th floor from what we heard. But uh, that's it so far. The only treatment at ground zero was of the rescue workers themselves, overcome by the dust and the smoke and the heat. This physician is treating them and then sends them back in. What we're doing for the rescue workers right now is providing oxygen, giving them breathing treatments, washing out eyes, you know, washing faces, you know, giving them water, giving them Tylenol, aspirin, rehydrating them orally. That's about it. I mean, we're, we're, we're there for them. We're just, and they just pick right up and go back. The volunteers come from throughout the region. You look exhausted. It's a lot of work up there. Have you been able to pull anybody out of there? I haven't seen anybody come out. You haven't seen anybody come out? How long have you been here? Oh, quite a few hours. There were thousands, probably, of people in these buildings. Sure. Where are they? Where did they go? They've got to be down in those sub-basements, I would imagine. Down in the sub-basements? It's just right all the way down, right through. What do you make of this? It's a horrible thing, something I'll hope to never see again. Unbelievable. They're saying uh, they can pan this to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, at least they could defend themselves. These were helpless people, you know, wives, women, children, and it was just uncalled for. This is the center of the rescue effort. Behind me, you can see what's left of one of the 110 story twin towers. A lot of these iron workers are volunteers who have come in from all over the city. Men and women who are more used to putting these buildings up than taking them down. Fred Clark has done both here. As a carpenter, he helped build the towers 30 years ago. Now he's working on the mountain of debris. You would never believe that it's gone. I mean, I look at it, this is, I've never seen anything. I was in Vietnam, I've never seen anything like this. Nothing like this to compare to this. What do you see now? 
What I see now is just heartbreaking, and I'm hopeful now I'm here with the rest of a lot of volunteers from my local, just hopefully, hopefully to find somebody still alive amongst us. But as I say, the longer the time takes to get to it, I'm sure the less the chances are that anyone will be alive. But it's just, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. That has become painfully clear to many doctors who have been here from the start. You were here last night. What did you see then? I think the most vivid thing was a picture of that Century 21 sign, building on fire, and uh, the fire truck with uh, the American flag undulating uh, with the well-lit light. And, uh, I think that's said it all. You know, Doctor, it seems to me that it must be very frustrating to be a physician and to have really so few patients to treat here. You well, know, you know, I, I don't know the numbers yet, but I, I certainly hope that means that a lot of people made it out alive. And, uh, obviously, it's horrific and incredible tragedy for those people who lost their lives. What do you make of this? Words fail. Words fail. When I call off your name, sound off loud and vigorous. Adrian! It's up! All day, the help kept coming. Troops from the Army Reserve and the National Guard came to the battle zone to help secure the entire lower end of Manhattan Island, which is now closed. Closed for both the search for bodies and the search for clues. In addition here, there's a crime scene investigation. We've seen a number of FBI agents with trash bags loaded with debris, and we ran into one New York City police officer who told us that his unit is looking in all the buildings around us, trying to find the black box recorder from one of the airplanes. They believe it could have ended up anywhere within a half mile area. In the search for bodies, there is a growing realization that there may be no one left alive. But for volunteer nurse John Steele and the others, there are powerful reasons to keep on going. It must be frustrating as a nurse to have so many victims here, and you can't get to them, and you can't help them. No, I, I think at this point, uh, when you know, in that kind of situation, the best thing that we can do is to try to do the right thing for the remainder of the family. You know, try to locate their loved ones, properly identify them, and hopefully have give them something to have a closure with, you know, to put this into perspective. For a moment of perspective, look at the Trade Center towers before the attack. Tower number one held a 300-foot mast used for television transmitters. Firefighters believe this is the tip of that mast today, standing upright but at ground level. By late afternoon, a fireman carried an American flag to the mast and raised it. Fellow firefighters wept as the stars and stripes flew in the smoke-filled sky and remained above them as they worked into twilight's last gleaming. The terrorists who set out to destroy America failed miserably. In fact, after September 11th, the nation was more united than ever. Americans were proud and patriotic and anxious to let the rest of the world know it. Across the nation, flags have been flying off the shelves. I've probably gone to eight or nine places. There are no flags. Walmart sold 200,000 yesterday and put more on order today. This is probably the most direct way for the common citizen to go show his support. I knew some people on those planes and I feel like I have to do something. Ever since the disaster, a wave of patriotism has been spreading across America. America is united, we are strong, we are stronger than ever. From blood drives to passing out freedom ribbons, if it's anything red, white, and blue, it's going to sell. At times like this, it's what we do in America. We, the people, pull together, and united we stand. We cease to be New Yorkers and Texans and become Americans really, really quick when the need is, is there. The first person comes up. At this New Orleans Army recruiting office and others, the young and the brave are preparing to defend the land of the free. I'm going to have confidence that our government will 
take the necessary action to see that justice is done. You want to be a part of that? Yes, sir. This country has to take care of itself. Nobody else is going to. That attitude has helped to more than double sales at BNS Guns and other shops since Tuesday's attack. This gun has no safety at all. Why are people coming in, do you think? The first day they were buying ammunition, and now they're beginning to buy defense yes, guns of their own. They don't know how far this goes. Yeah. For this man, it only goes as far as trying to vent his frustration out at a paper target. I've been antsy. I've run every emotion there is since Tuesday, and I thought, well, this is something I can do that's harmless. Across the country, from dusk to dawn, young and old, the emotions have run the gambit. These terrorists did what no politician, no speaker, no any, nothing else, no one else could do, and that is bring Americans together. But the sentiment and the symbol are the same. Maureen Maher, CBS News, Dallas. September 14th, rescue and recovery operations were proceeding at the World Trade Center site and at the Pentagon. The Bush administration was making plans for a war on terrorism. But for a moment, the nation paused to remember the victims. Americans were united via television for a national prayer service with the president playing the role of comforter in chief. In the majestic National Cathedral in Washington, President Bush today expressed the grief and anguish of a nation stunned by this week's horrific attacks. Just three days removed from these events, Americans do not yet have the distance of history, but our responsibility to history is already clear to answer these attacks and rid the world of evil. The event brought together past presidents, presidential aspirants, and members of Congress. At the insistence of the White House, the service was multi-denominational, multi-faith. The implicit message, the whole of America, indeed, the whole world was touched by this tragedy. Keep our country strong for the sake of the good and righteousness and protect us, our Lord, from all evil. The Reverend Billy Graham, who himself summoned the strength to make a rare public appearance, implored Americans not to be cowed before the cruel terrorist plot. But now we have a choice, whether to implode and disintegrate emotionally and spiritually as a people and a nation, or whether we choose to become stronger. Yet even as speaker after speaker sought to calm an anxious nation, there was more evidence of growing security concerns. Air Force One now shadowed everywhere by fighter jets. Information about the president's movements now tightly guarded. The commander in chief very much on active duty every day one step further down the road to war. This nation is peaceful, but fierce when stirred to anger. This conflict was begun on the timing and terms of others. It will end in a way and at an hour of our choosing. Later in the day, an important symbol as the president defied the threat to national security to visit ground zero. America today is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. The symbols of U.S. dominance in ruins around him, thousands dead beneath the rubble, Mr. Bush rallied exhausted rescue workers, pledging those responsible will pay a heavy price. The defiant words hit home with firefighters who have spent frustrating days searching the wreckage amid dimming hopes that any of their comrades will be found alive. Uptown from the epicenter, the president toured the makeshift FEMA headquarters and spent time with families of New York police officers missing in the crumpled buildings. Away from the view of cameras, Mr. Bush met with the mother of one officer whose body was recovered on Tuesday. She gave the president his badge. Speaking to the White House press corps, President Bush said of the destruction in New York, you have to see it to understand the full impact. 
I said that this was the first uh, act of war on America in the 21st century. And uh, uh, I was right, particularly having seen the scene. In the hours after the attack on the World Trade Center, thousands of people waited anxiously to learn the fate of relatives and friends. Did they make it out alive? Had anyone seen them? Soon the agonizing hours turned into frustrating days, searching for the missing. It's been a very busy day here at the Manhattan Armory behind me. The mission here is for folks who have relatives who work at the World Trade Center who they haven't spoken to or seen since the disaster of two days ago to come here and file a missing persons report. Police want to match some of the names with some faces of folks who are being treated perhaps in area hospitals but who have yet to be identified. For many who came here today, it was yet another unreal, frustrating day. They began lining up early, armed with pictures, medical records, and lots of hope. We're not going to give up. Anybody. We know she's on the list, so yeah, see somebody we're keeping that the hope, like we're keeping our faith. And Jennifer Laws, we were all waiting for you. After standing in line for hours, they were interviewed in private by New York police detectives and counselors. Many left photos of their loved ones on telephone poles and mailboxes, hoping someone would see them and call. Last night, I couldn't sleep. I had to go break in his apartment and uh, get a phone number, call all his family from here to Africa, and everybody been calling me all night last night. If anyone has any idea if they've seen him or knows where he is, to call us. <laughs> He's got two little babies. Two little babies. And there would be more agony. Once inside, friends and family were shown by city officials a list of some 2,000 names of those either in area hospitals or seen at some point by doctors. If you haven't seen your family member on that list, it could still mean they, ha they don't know where he is. Julia Boroshevsky's brother was not on the list. She says the past 48 hours have been unbearable. This is just, it's just been so unbelievable. It's, it's like surreal. It, it, it's not happening. It's just like the worst nightmare in hell. We don't know like what day it is or, or where we are. It, it, you, 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 the words can't just describe it. Word, words cannot describe it. Former President Bill Clinton came by the armory tonight, the armory tonight rather, to meet with families and lend his support. By the end of the day, New York City police will have processed more than 4,000 missing persons reports. And for those who have not been here yet, the armory reopens tomorrow at 8 a.m. Was it God or fate or nothing but luck that made somebody late enough that morning to live? Instead of making a left to go to the elevators, I made a right and I went into the concourse and I went to an optometrist shop and I was being fitted for reading glasses. I needed new glasses. What made Michael LaMonico, the chef at Windows on the World, decide to run an errand before heading up to the restaurant on the 107th floor of the North Tower? And when I got out to the street, I knew something terrible had happened. I thought my people. I mean, I thought all my people. Day or night, seven days a week, there was never a time when his people were not there. Uh, I saw a fireball of, uh, I'm completely um, sorry that I witnessed any of this. When that uh, second tower burst into flames, I just, I hadn't lost hope, but I, I thought, Another human being can't do this to people. It can't be. Since that moment on that day, Michael LaMonaco's obsession, shared with every boss from every company at the World Trade Center, has been to find out who's safe, who's dead, but most of all, who's missing. Good afternoon, Beacon Restaurant Wonders of the World Hotline. By Wednesday, a Windows on the World Hotline had been set up at another restaurant unaccounted for out of 500 employees, maybe 50. I lost my sister. She, she works at Windows of the World. This is her picture here on my right. Lucia Francis. Um, this is my 50th birthday when we took our pictures together. 
So someone look carefully. This one is on my right, Lucille. One after another, Michael LaMonaco and Elizabeth Ortiz, Human Resources Director for Windows, listen to the scared, sad voices. You've got this list. On this list, it's missing, 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 missing. It's a, a really grim experience. We haven't lost anybody yet. They're, we can't say lost. They're just, they, they haven't been found, so they're missing. I, I mean, how, how else can we feel? We have to have some hope. When Windows on the World opened, food critic Gail Green wrote, down below is all of Manhattan and helicopters and clouds. Everything to hate and fear is invisible, she said. How ironic that seems now. Elizabeth Ortiz and her assistant, Christina Quinn, together on Friday, made the rounds, found themselves along with thousands of others trying to find names on lists, touching them the way people touched the names on the Vietnam Wall. The missing smile at us. We peer into the privacy of their past happiness. Like the population of a whole lost city, they are gathered spirits haunting us. Oh. 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 Missing, Jose Nunez, one of the windows on the world kitchen crew. At the end of the day, Elizabeth and Christina have learned that one man is dead, not missing. That's all. They have no news for the family of assistant pastry chef Norberto Hernandez. For one heartbreaking night, they thought he was in a hospital in New Jersey. Once we got there, it was the wrong person. It was by somebody by the name of Greg Hernandez. It wasn't him, so. Wrong Hernandez. Yes. Yes. So they continue to look. They pray, as thousands of other families pray, that their loved ones will be found alive, not here. We see the bucket brigades, the rubble mountains. They are oblivious to them. They are hardly aware of the threat of war, these families. They live with their hope and their Xeroxed pictures. Missing. Mohammed Saladin Chowdhury, 39 years old, from Bangladesh. He had a master's degree in physics, but worked as a banquet waiter. His brother and his cousin are devastated. If he's alive, that's fine. If he's not alive, still we have to come to kind of conclusion that, okay, this is... Uh, what if you never find out? Let's hope that, oh, oh, hopefully I mean, not. Let's, hopefully hope, not. let's hope that you will find him. We'll find him. We can go. If for no other reason to see his son, Farkat Saad Chowdhury was born at 9.13 a.m. September 13th, almost exactly 48 hours after his father, like 5,000 other people, went to work as usual and disappeared. From the small town of Ridgewood, New Jersey, my hometown, you can see New York City's skyline 17 miles away. It's a convenient commute to New York's downtown financial district, and every morning hundreds of locals board these trains bound for Wall Street. Go. Tuesday, many of them did not come home. At least 12 of our Ridgewood neighbors, and possibly many more, are still missing in the World Trade Center rubble. Hundreds narrowly escaped with their lives. The entire town has been shocked and transformed. Flags fly at half-mast, and they fly everywhere. The Overlook, once a place of beauty and romance, has been turned into a memorial. Everyone in town wants to do something to help. Children canvass the neighborhoods for donations for the rescue workers. The town's Red Cross office is a buzz. Volunteers load supply trucks and answer thousands of calls. 
but we really appreciate you calling the Red Cross. A People situation. feel in such an intense, overwhelming need to do right. something. They want right to be now. there. They uh, want to help try and find somebody. They want to pull away the, right the concrete and the glass. I mean, these people, they yes, don't, they don't say, they don't ask, right would it be now. risky? This past week, what will be a sad season of memorial services began. Friends of John Van Dievender, my friend, came together in a local church to mourn his passing and offer condolences to his wife, Annie, their three children, Johnny, Janie, and Molly. People speak of the untold number of lives touched by this overwhelming catastrophe. Just look at the number of people affected by the death of just one victim. A thousand people, from the pizza maker to the golf pro, packed the church and stood outside for John's service. Relatives remembered him as a young boy. Johnny had that twinkle, that, that little impish grin. He could get away with murder. There were those who spoke of John as a father. But if Janie was playing softball, John was coaching the team. If Molly was on the couch watching a movie, John was right there next to Molly watching a movie. Johnny was playing junior football, John ends up being president of the junior football program. They also remembered him as a friend. When I had a baby, he was the one who took me out for a cigar and a beer. When I was down, he always knew how to pick me up. Johnny Van was truly larger than life. And they remembered him as a neighbor. I know you're listening, John, so I want you to know that I view this as a temporary relocation, for I know one day we will be neighbors again. Friends pledged to stand by John's family. Johnny, Janie, and Molly, while none of us will ever be able to replace your father, we want you to know that between your uncles and each of us, You'll have a lot of eyes on you and a lot of concerned and helping hands available each and every day. We love you guys. There were tears and laughter. <laughs> Reverence and irreverence. He would show up at Ridgewood Country Club in his 1990, whatever that thing was, green minivan with the bumper falling off, no brakes, no air conditioning. It was filled with newspapers and all kinds of debris. And he'd kid the valets how he knew they were all fighting over who's gonna get to park his car. Look at all the lives just one victim touched. When I or any other kid was around him, I could always act like a kid. I didn't always have to mind my manners and act like an adult like I do around other grown-ups. We could just be ourselves as if he was just one of the guys. All the little things that make a life. Not much good has come out of this disaster, but Mr. Van has changed all of our lives so very much, all in our own way. And on September 11th, 2001, we lost one of the greatest fathers and persons in Ridgewood. But now we have gained an angel. John's niece, Ashley. When I found out in school that the World Trade Center had been bombed, I called my aunt and she said, Ashley, he's going to be OK. And even though he's not here with us today, I know he's OK. And we're all going to be OK. John has come home to Ridgewood. He was found and identified by an inscription on his wedding band, one of fewer than 200 victims identified of the more than 6,000 still missing. September 11th was a day the worst brought out the best. So many Americans wanted to help in some way. It will long be remembered as a time ordinary people did extraordinary things, beginning with the passengers aboard hijacked United Airlines Flight 93. History will show it was they who made the first declaration of war against the terrorists. With the battle cry, let's roll, they fought the hijackers until the plane crashed in a Pennsylvania field. Heroism documented in a final call from the plane to telephone operator Lisa Jefferson. Miss Jefferson told her story to CBS News correspondent Cynthia Bowers. When I took the call over, there was a soft-spoken, calm gentleman on the other end. 
He told me that there's three people that have taken over the flight. At that point, I asked him his name. He told me Todd Beamer. He was from Cranberry, New Jersey. Did you make a conscious decision not to tell Todd about the World Trade Center? Why? Yes. Because um, I wanted him to have hope. I wanted him to think that he still had a chance. I didn't want him to feel like it was just totally hopeless and he definitely didn't have a choice and he knew he was going to die. I didn't want him to have that feeling. When he wanted to pray, was your sense then that, that he knew that? Yes, I did. I felt that he knew at that time because he had said, oh, Jesus, help us. And then he said, Lisa, would you recite the Lord's Prayer with me? And I knew that he knew at that time that it wasn't much left for him to do. What do you think that um, this country needs to know about the men and women who were on board Flight 93? They're all heroes in my eyes. They really are. They all pitched together, and they did what they thought was the best thing to do at that time. And um, I feel that Todd played a great role in that because when he told the guys, are you ready, I assumed that they were waiting on his cue. Then they responded to him, and he said, okay, let's roll. And would you please help me welcome his wife, Lisa Beamer, here tonight. She called me that Saturday morning. I told her, I said, you have two boys, David and Andrew. She said, yes, yes, I do. I said, and you're expecting your third child? She said, yes, he told you all of that. I said, yes, he did. And he wanted me to let you know that he loved you and his family very much. And I gave her a message and kept my promise. The end of Flight 11 was the beginning of the terror for so many others. I was on the 81st floor. Tell me what you saw and heard. It just, just my had 40 people in there, just an explosion. Just a light flash out my, my window. My whole doorway to the entrance of my office blew open. Michael Benfonte works for Network Plus, a communications firm. After the impact of Flight 11, he calmed his staff, then led them through the smoke and debris to the stairwell. So I started going down the steps. I heard people shouting. I stopped at like 68, and there's a woman in a wheelchair. Benfonte had a tough choice to make up on the 68th floor. He was still far from safety himself, but there was someone who needed his help. Tina Hansen, the woman in the wheelchair, would surely slow him down. And he had to decide, would he help her or just save himself? When you saw Tina, did, did you know her? No. Did you know her name? No. Did you know what she did? You ever nope. seen her before? Not that I can recall. Michael and co-worker John Chiquera didn't hesitate. They picked up 41-year-old Tina Hansen in her wheelchair and began carrying her down, down 68 flights of stairs. What was it about that that made you decide to help her? I acted in the only way that I knew how to. I don't know if I would have been able to live with myself if I didn't help her. It took about an hour and a half, but Michael and John carried Tina all the way down and out of the burning building to what they thought was safety. And at this point, Tower 2 was already down, but I didn't even realize that. And, uh, and there weren't many people around. It was very, very bizarre. So we, find, we see an ambulance, and, and we place her into the ambulance. And at that point, she sits down, and, and, and she's, the first time she really became upset, she started to cry. So Did she, she say anything to you? She just motioned for me to give her a hug. He had carried her down 68 flights of stairs, put her in an ambulance, and walked away. But they still weren't safe. Tower One began to collapse. <gasps> right, oh my God. When all of a sudden we hear this explosion, I can hear this rumbling. And I looked back once, and I didn't look back again, and I just started running with all my might. Michael ran for his life. And a wave of debris just came over, and then everything went completely black and completely silent for a while. He didn't know if Tina's ambulance had made it out. I didn't think she made it. So what did you think had happened to her? I just thought that the, she got caught in the collapse in the rubble. Michael had forgotten to ask her name. Chaos. Days later, he learned her name and her fate from a reporter. 
You never knew her name? Never knew her name. So it was People Magazine who told you her name? Yeah, and told me she was alive for the first time. I couldn't even speak to the woman after that. I was, I was like a baby, I was crying. This is similar to the loft style. Now, Michael is looking for a new office. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we want, we want to go any larger than this. He and Tina talk several times a week. He's a selfless man. He thinks about other people. This week, Tina is back at work, and she's healthy, thanks to Michael. I, I'm really glad to know him. Yeah, I'm glad to <laughs> that he was there. Elected officials are often judged by how well they perform in their first 100 days in office. Rudolph Giuliani may well be judged by his final 100 days as mayor of the city of New York at a time when the people of the city needed reassurance and a beacon to lead the way. They found both in a man who became known as America's mayor. For every single person touched by this unthinkable tragedy, there's been one man who, above all others, has been the beacon holding the city together and leading it forward. He's the mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. This is a better city now than it was before the attack took place in terms of its spirituality and its understanding of what it means to be an American, its understanding of unity. We spoke with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani the ultimate general in his emergency command center in New York City. And you know, having gone through this experience back on the 11th, and then having gone through the experience with cancer the year before that, I've I, I, I kind of have a philosophy that goes something like this. Every day, you never know. You don't know what's going to happen to you. So you might as well take advantage of life, not go hide somewhere. We're going to take airplanes when we're supposed to for business or pleasure. We're going to... Uh, go to public events, and we're going to do the things that we normally would do. The best way to get your children to stop being afraid is to stop being afraid yourself. Mayor, what do we tell the children? I think we hug them a lot. I think we let them know that we're there for them. You got to talk about it. Whether you talk about it with friends, whether you talk about it with your children, you got to get it out. You got to talk about it. And children need that, and some of them need it professionally. I'm interested to know how you're doing. I'm doing, I'm doing okay, you know, uh, I, at some point I'm going to have to just go off by myself and reflect on all the people that I've known that I've lost and uh, there's a whole personal part to what happened at the World Trade Center that I just haven't had the time to think about too much because I need to focus on the things I need to do to keep the city together and moving the city together, but every once in a while at the funerals and you, I realize how many friends I lost. And, or a missing. And Have you had time to grieve? Only, uh, only intermittently. I had to go to a funeral service, and then I, on the after the funeral service, I went into a bathroom by myself, just locked the door, and just cried, just cried for about four or five minutes. I want to shift gears for a moment. Tell me, what is your philosophy of leadership? So many people are admiring your leadership just now. I think that yeah, you have to. I think there are a couple of things. You have to lead by example. And you have to be honest. You've got to be willing to work as hard as the people that you're asking to work with you and not be removed from them. I'm here on behalf of a very grateful and very admiring city to tell each and every one of you how proud we are of you and saying how proud we are of the innocent men and women who are going about their lives seeking their part of the American dream when their lives were cut short by the act of cowardly terrorists, and how proud we are of all of you who have come here to rescue them and return as many of them as we can to their loved ones. What about those who say, and there are plenty of people, whether they voice it or not, are saying, I fear a second strike, they'll come again. And for me personally, this person would say, that's a realistic fear. It is a realistic fear, but you've got to overcome it. Every precaution is being taken that can be taken in a free society. There are no guarantees, and now we have to go about leading our lives. Right now, things are very safe. People should go to a restaurant, go to the movies, go to plays, enjoy ball games, play with your kids, use the parks, and that's starting to happen. We're back to about 85% the way we measure it, maybe even 90%. When I was down at City Hall this morning, walking around, there were a tremendous number of people 
from different parts of the country who said they came here because they heard that I asked them to come. And I was very, very happy about that. People from Tennessee, Seattle, Los Angeles, uh, and a lot of people from Oregon who have come in as part of a large uh, group from the state of Oregon to show their uh, support for New York. Mayor, no doubt there'll be commissions and there'll be a procedure for deciding what happens in lower Manhattan, what's rebuilt, what isn't, how it's rebuilt, and so forth. I want to get a sense of what's inside you. Do you find yourself saying, I hope we rebuild the Twin Towers or not? The, the most important thing to focus on is the appropriate memorial. Something beautiful, something uplifting, something that really captures the patriotism and the heroism of the people that were there. That's the most important thing. There's no question we're going to rebuild. The skyline will be whole again, and also uh, the reality is that the people in New York City are going to be whole again. Among the nearly 5,000 cops, firemen, iron workers, and demolition crews that show up every day and every night at Ground Zero to search for some 4,000 people still buried in the rubble of what was the World Trade Center are an untold number of unpaid volunteers. They came from around the city and across the country right after the disaster. And seven weeks later, they're still there, citizens of what is in effect a city within a city. Since day one, they lined up by the thousands, volunteering to help in any way they could. There was such a huge turnout that many were turned away. But right now, there is no other volunteers near at the site. But some wouldn't take no for an answer, like the vice president of an investment bank who puts in a full day's work and then spends nearly all night organizing the relief effort. The computer programmer who left his job and his family in Florida and drove a truck to New York to deliver supplies to Ground Zero. A group of Texans who set up a 24-hour sidewalk barbecue stand to feed emergency personnel. The massage therapist who gave up her regular business to set up shop at Ground Zero where she felt she was more needed than anywhere else. And a food caterer who left his paying job to volunteer in the rescue effort. I had to get involved. Really, nothing else mattered. I called my job and basically told him that I had something that I had to do and that would be involved in search and rescue. His name is Sam Carl and he was one of the first to pull bodies out of the wreckage. I was usually on my stomach uh, digging through the holes. Because of his experience as a mountain rescuer in Colorado, Sam Carl was assigned to be a cave crawler. That's what they call someone who goes deep into the rubble trying to find signs of life in the smallest places. Day in and day out, it's very difficult um, when you're not given that satisfaction of seeing somebody, you know, climb out with you. And day in and day out, for the past 59 days, Margie Edwards, the investment banker, goes right from her office in New Jersey to a command post about 15 blocks from ground zero. This is easy. What she is doing is making up a wish list of what workers say they need to do their job down at the site. So far, she has managed to get companies all over the country to donate nearly a million dollars worth of goods to make sure this city within a city gets everything it needs. It's one of the things that we have a shortage of is sweatshirts. And it's getting colder. Yeah. And so on this chilly night, Margie Edwards and the team of women who work with her, all with full-time jobs in banking and marketing, have collected hundreds of sweatshirts for iron workers who have no choice but to discard them each time they come off the pile because they are covered with dust and other particles that could spread disease. The women go in and out of ground zero up to 10 times a night, often until two in the morning, delivering whatever it is rescue workers need to do their jobs, like the ones working in the hot spots. Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Steel-toed uh, boots? Steel-toed boots. Out still on the rubble it's still uh, i believe 1100 degrees the guy's boots just melt within a few hours um, and they're burning their feet right next to that burning pile of rubble is a sort of general store stocked with goggles socks gloves drinks snacks and chocolate everything free for the taking all right what do you need man? i just want to get some hand some what all right 
So you got hand wipes too? Huh? Got everything you want. We got everything. We got everything. Yeah. Thank God they did. For people like this who are volunteering, what does that mean for the guys who are down here working? I give them more credit than the guys that are up on the iron doing the actual work. How's that? Bottom line, they're you say. They're looking out for you. Yeah, be out here volunteering, not getting paid. That's uh, a lot of credit. So you're doing a full-time job, and then this is another full-time job. How many hours a day do you put in? 16, 17 hours. So you've been doing this for over a month now. How long can you continue? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. And this is pure volunteer. I mean, uh, you're not being paid for any of this. Now, I can see the tears in your eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, it's very personal for me. My friend Todd is, is in there. And when I come down, to, when I come down here, I talk to him. I want him to know that I'll be here with him, that he's not alone. And these girls have kept me going as well as the police officers and everyone around. To help keep the rescue workers going, both mentally and physically, Donna DeFalco put her massage business on hold right after the attack and brought a team of massage therapists down to Ground Zero where they worked for nearly 60 hours straight. But you never really thought about sleep because you saw these men just, they just didn't stop. They never stopped. And so you kind of felt like if, if they can do it, you, know, you, have, you, have, you should really should be doing this along with them. Donna DeFalco's team has been going around the clock ever since. So far, they've given more than a thousand back rubs to firefighters and iron workers as they come off the pile. They couldn't move. They physically couldn't move. Their muscles were so tight. And if you gave them 20 minutes, 25 minutes, they got up and they said, oh my God, I feel so much better. I can go out and do more. And they would. This is a city within a city. It's become that. And it's unbelievable to watch the connection and the, the way people have just pulled together. Nancy has been working at Ground Zero every night since September 11th as a volunteer for the Salvation Army. During the day, she works in the financial district. Her responsibility here is to make sure rescue workers have enough to drink so they don't get dehydrated. It's very different in here than when you go out on the outside. And a lot of the people here have expressed that it's, uh, it's difficult for them to, to take a day off or do they feel guilty or they want to continue to be here and, and very difficult for them to get back to their life again. So this has become almost their home. And for some, it's been a return home. The eagle has landed in New York. Mike Orsa, that computer programmer from Florida who grew up in New York, has been living in the city for the past eight weeks using his flatbed truck to deliver supplies to Ground Zero for the Salvation Army. I mean, you, you sort of get used to people who will do a couple hours of, of volunteer work in their neighborhood or will write a check for an organization, but you've been up here for a month. I don't... Help me understand that. Um, it's been rewarding. You're getting something in return for this. Yeah, a great feeling of satisfaction. I feel my kids, as they get older and older, will this becomes part of history, say, hey, you know, so, my, you know, my dad helped, he did something, he made a little bit of a difference, and just to teach them that this is what you do. The difference people are making is staggering. Since day one, private citizens and restaurants have given out more than three million meals. You don't have to thank me, my friend. Nino Vendome closed his restaurant to the general public on September 12th. My home is your home. Now his restaurant, just north of Ground Zero, is open 24 hours, seven days a week to emergency personnel. Everyone eats for free. And Nino says he plans to keep it that way for at least a year with support from corporations and local merchants, as well as volunteers who help his staff. Like these women who during the day are teacher's aides at an elementary school in Ozone Park, Queens, just outside Manhattan. We want to give back. We want to give back to what they do on the cross. Every day we see them on television and they're working so hard and they're doing so much and this is all we could do for them. What do you get out of this? A high. Really, you I feel, feel good. so good that I'm doing this. I, I, was, I was home, I'd be sleeping now, but now I just feel energetic. I just, and sleep. I just want to keep on working. How you doing, sir? And along the sidewalk just across the street from Nino's is an all-day, all-night Texas barbecue stand 
run by a group of recovering drug addicts and alcoholics who drove up from Dallas in five trailers carrying huge loads of meat and wood for their two barbecue pits. And I told a buddy of mine, Jimbo, it's Jimbo, we got to go to ground zero. So they drove around New York City until they happened upon a disaster relief center where they overheard a Red Cross official talking about a shortage of food. And he was saying, uh, well, we have 2,000 men to feed Sunday with a barbecue. How are we going to cook this? And I said, well, sir, I might be able to help you. I'm from Texas, and I've got two smokers and 30,000 pounds of meat and 12 cords of wood. We're coming to have a barbecue. He said, I'll need to talk to you. <laughs> so we've been here ever since. They won't let us go. The city won't let us go. How many people have you fed here? Well, actually, since we started, we've, we've averaged about 4,000 people a day. 4,000 people a day? Yes, sir. They work in shifts, and some of them even sleep in the cab of the tractor trailer. And there's no, there's no paychecks or anything in this No, well. absolutely not. Well, yes, there is, too. <laughs> a chance to make amends for all the wrong that I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. It's like God's giving me a chance to work with other people mm -hmm. in a good way instead of a bad way. And then, in that city within a city, there's a story unto itself about a squad of cops, members of the New York City Highway Patrol. Before September 11th, as they themselves will tell you, to anyone who went over the speed limit, they were the devils in the rearview mirror. Today, to the people down here, they're more like angels on motorcycles. Now, whenever they go to ground zero or leave, they are cheered by another group of volunteers who've been standing on street corners nearby for almost 24 hours a day since September 11th. They're out here applauding us now. They're applauding you? It's incredible. There's crowds of people out there three, four, five o'clock in the morning cheering, waving flags. Right? And that is an inspiration. That's like the best part of the day. Yeah, they really give you a boost it's funny, like, when, when you see that. Going home. After 16, 17 hours being down here, the reason for all this adulation is that these highway patrol officers have volunteered for one of the most wrenching jobs at Ground Zero. Whenever someone in uniform is pulled from the wreckage, a firefighter, law enforcement officer, or emergency worker, it is the job of these policemen to salute the body or body part and to provide a ceremonial escort to the city morgue for identification. They've been doing just that around the clock from day one. We try to show up and represent our, our units, our, our friends, our peers, our, you know, our co-workers as best as we can by giving them you know, that, that final ride. That when we turn over the remains to the morgue, it's been our, our privilege to serve that person and our, um, our honor to be able to provide them with uh, final dignity. Thank you. How difficult is it for you guys to go down there? I mean, you don't go down there once. You've been there over and over and over. For me personally, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done. And you know you're... You know what you're going down there for. Is... Sometimes you're doing it 14 times a day, 15 times a day. It's almost like back a Back and forth. Scramble. You come back and they say, we have another body. We're back doing the same thing, and everyone is just as important as the next one. 23 New York City police officers were among those killed. So far, the bodies of only four have been recovered. That's got to wear on you guys. Yes, it does. Sometimes I don't know how they hold up. Captain Kevin Hickey, who's been on the New York City Police Force for 32 years, runs this highway patrol unit. Do they come to you and talk about it? Yes, they do. And like I explained to them, right now, you need to be a professional, okay? There are times when you can break down, but, you know, it, it happens, and I've seen it. I've seen them right into the, you know, into the 30th Street morgue with the tears coming down their face. The officers say what gets them through is the kindness of the volunteers. You gotta understand something. Before them, there was no water, there was nothing to eat, there was not a smiling face around here. And these are people that put their lives on hold, put all their personal needs aside for us. The people here, if they've said thank you once, they've said it a thousand times. I've never seen a people come together like, like has happened around here. It's been incredible. This is, 
I mean, there's no more southern hospitality in Texas than there is in New York tonight. I'm, I'm telling you, it's awesome. Even though this is a, a horrific tragedy, this is New York's finest hour, and I believe that. Even as America was counting its dead, the time was coming to get on with life. In the days after September 11th, the President of the United States, the Mayor of New York, urged people to resume their normal routines, go to theaters and ball games again, go back to work, and many did. But for some, it was hardly business as usual. There was nothing random about the acts of terrorism against the World Trade Center. The Twin Towers were not just symbols of American finance, the people who worked there were at the very heart of it, like the small investment banking firm of San O'Neill. Its headquarters were on the 104th floor of Tower 2, but its roots were in the very heart of America. Its business was providing financial expertise and services to small and medium-sized banks and savings and loans all across the country. They had friends in places like Wayne, New Jersey, Sioux City, Iowa, and Santa Barbara, California. Of Sandler O'Neill's 171 employees, 83 reported for work at the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th. Only 17 made it out alive. For the people of Sandler O'Neill, continuing their business is every bit as important and symbolic as the act that almost ended it. We were allowed to join them a few days after the disaster in their small midtown office where Sandler O'Neill had first come to regroup hiring crisis counselors and therapists, searching hospitals, and trying to console and help the families of friends and colleagues who were dead or missing. Hey, Billy, Bill Hickey. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I just wanted to say hello and see if, uh, if I could do anything for you, buddy. The bankers and brokers and analysts had all worked the phones before, but never in a situation like this. Right. It's going to be hard We've for all us, Billy, but of, man, uh, if, if, you got to let me know uh, if there's anything at all I can do for you. Man. But they couldn't give people the two things they wanted to hear, good news or hard information. I've already touched base today with Wright, Clark, Edwards, Collins, Wisnowski, and Brett. Okay. Okay. The names and the families went on and on. Partners, assistants, researchers, clerks, rainmakers, and number crunchers. I've made contact today with uh, Doug Ergang's mom, uh, David Rice's, uh, the guy who identified David Rice's well, body, father, Richard Von Feld, yeah. I've spoken to Chris Newton Carter's wife at length. Right. And, uh... I, I was with Patty Rosen this morning. Okay. Were you? Yeah. How's she doing? She helped me more than I helped yeah. her. Yeah. Sandler O'Neill's strongest asset had always been its people and the experience that comes with highly trained employees who understood the company's business and had personal relationships with its customers. But as each day passed, it had become apparent that much of that intellectual and human capital had been depleted. If they're having trouble identifying them, we'll start having the parents go down for the DNA. Okay. And then I'll print out and list the order of how the siblings and who they want to go first for DNA samples. But right now, if we can get people to send stuff over, like with scars, shoe size, blood type, um, inscriptions of wedding band. As the grim reality set in, the job of resurrecting Sandler O'Neill had fallen on the shoulders of its 44-year-old managing partner, Jimmy Dunn. Well, uh... You know, it's, uh, I'm sad, but focused. His company had lost its entire communication system, nearly every piece of paper, a third of its people, not to mention two of his best friends and top executives, senior managing partner Herman Sandler and Chris Quackenbush, the man who ran the investment banking business. It was just incredible that, that 66 people could be missing and nothing, nothing. Just like they were gone. That 21. Sandler. Just four days after the attack, the survivors at Sandler O'Neill had already moved into temporary quarters given to them by Bank of America. Brokerage houses and investment banks, competitors in what had been the cutthroat world of Wall Street finance, offered equipment, people, and services, whatever Sandler O'Neill needed to stay alive. And so uh, we're here and we're doing business. By Monday morning, with the market set to reopen, they were moved in and ready to go, in spite of the fact that most of their stock traders were among the missing. Terry Maltese, who had run another division of the company, moved in and took charge. 
this has been a horrible week, as everybody knows. And it, it's amazing what's happened, and it's amazing everything we've had to do, and I'm very proud of everything we have done here. I'm more sad about everything we've lost and that we had to do this. Talking to the families was the worst thing. We've got a lot of distraught families, a lot of people that are very upset. People don't know what they're going to do, uh, and a lot of kids and, and wives missing their husbands. Um, a few days ago, we started collecting DNA here. Um, <laughs> these are things I never thought any of us would do. Um, we've done them. We're going to continue to do every single thing we can do for the families for as long as it takes. But in order to do that, one of the things we need to do is we need to be in business. So today, we're in business. And it is going to work. We have no choice. Okay? We're going to do this, and we're going to do it because not doing it's not going to be an option. And people want to do business with us. As they waited for the first opening bell in six days, the employees of Sandler O'Neill, along with the rest of the financial community, stopped and prayed before returning to business. Right, we're open. They quickly discovered that there were lots of things that needed to be worked out. These phones aren't working. What is with these phones? Guys, pick up all your lines. Press on the red ones and hang them up. Give me it. Hold on. Ozzy, look, we got a really big problem here. Nobody is on our lines, and they're all lit up. You know what? Mark, you're going to have to use that. Is that phone good? We, yeah, we got to rotate. You take that phone, and I'll get off the, this line. I, that's my phone. Across the front of the office, on spreadsheets normally used to report sales and earnings, was a long list of funerals, wakes, and memorial services. And Jimmy Dunn was determined that there would be Sandler O'Neill partners at all of them. Oh, God. My best friend's on uh, Saturday. And a guy that we were in the same summer house with 20 years ago for six years is the same day, same time. And then a great friend of mine's that morning, so I'll be both of those. And Herman's is on Monday, so yeah. I will miss him every day for the rest of my life. The services have been heartrending, exhausting, and relentless in their sheer numbers. Two and three a day, well into the month of October. The battered firm has pledged to continue paying the salaries of its lost employees, at least through the end of the year, plus bonuses and family benefits until 2006. A foundation has been set up for long-term assistance, but whatever they do, founding partners Fred Price and Tom O'Neill, the O'Neill and Sandler O'Neill, say it can never be enough. You talk to a father who's lost his second son through this tragedy, a mother who lost her son that she adored, who couldn't wait for his career to develop, right. um, you know, a wife who just had a baby two months ago who lost her husband. It comes at you in waves. You know, you'll be sitting there, and as long as I keep on moving, I'm all right. And you stop, and you know, it, it's, it's painful. Uh, but if you say on, on adrenaline, I mean, I think there's a, uh, I think you always work on adrenaline. I mean, it's part of the business. You hired a lot of young people. Yeah. We hired who a lot of young people. sons and daughters of, of friends of yours. Absolutely. Has it made it harder for you, the you, fact that you, some of your best friends? Incredibly friend harder. I don't know that I'll do it anymore, frankly. But I mean, I, I need to do it again because it was a good thing. And it's, you know, I can't let, you know, fear, I can't let them win. I'm about to go bid one on two blocks of uh, 30 well, years old, six and a half right now. They are doing some deals, holding on to their clients and feeling confident enough to shop for permanent office space. Stock's a little better. It's green, green. I've not seen any of that. Got a couple of greens. That's encouraging. If I didn't know and I just walked in here, I would have thought that you had been in these offices forever. Uh, well, that's, uh, you know, we, we, we're like, uh, you know, to me, we feel like we're at war. I mean, they attacked the United States of America. They attacked the capitalistic structure that we flourished under. They attacked our little firm and, you know, and they killed our friends. So we, we have a low tolerance for the petty issues right now. And that, you know, if, if you can't adapt and move, well, then, 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 you know, then you have to do something else. So this is, this is like combat to me right now. They were intent on destroying this country. 
Um, I don't think we, we appreciated the depth of their hatred. But I think uh, for every percentage that we might have underestimated them, I think they've very much underestimated us. The human impact of the attack on America is measured in numbers of dead and wounded. But there are other victims as well. Young children who lost a parent. The children of September. Of all the things we heard about September 11th, in many ways, this is the most painful. It's estimated that 10,000 children lost a parent that day, a father or a mother who went to work and never came home. The children of September heard the sound of their parent leaving that morning, not knowing that the door was closing on dreams and hopes and all the days to follow. I think, well, on September 11th, I would tell them not to go to work. I just wish I could take a time travel and go back in time. And I would also tell him that I loved him. Danielle Spinelli is eight years old. That's her dad, Frank Spinelli. Her brother, Chris, 14, big sister, Nicole, 18, and their mom, Michelle. What do you remember about that morning with your dad? He would uh, kiss us goodbye in the morning. And it was just, you know, one of those things that you would just maybe roll over and just be like, Dad, it's too early. But he told me one time, you know, Nikki, I kiss you and your brother and sister goodbye in the morning to, uh, you know, let you know that if anything ever happened to me at work, that you would always know that I loved you. Dad spent weekends shuttling the kids to soccer, lacrosse, football. By day, he was a foreign exchange broker, but he often hurried home from his new job at the World Trade Center. September 11th, when the first plane hit, he called his wife so she wouldn't worry. Hi, honey, it's me. Uh, plane at the building. Um, I'm okay. Uh, the building's on fire. We're trying to get out. I love you. I'll see you later. Frank Spinelli was found in the wreckage two weeks before his 45th birthday. Every birthday, we'd always bake him a cake and we'd always have presents in the dining room. Did you bake the cake anyway this year? Uh, my mom and sister did, yeah. They did bake a cake. <laughs> I just knew that if he was here, that he'd want a cake. So I just decided to bake it with my mom. How's your mom? Uh, I guess she's all right. I mean, it's hard for her. I mean, I feel really bad for her. I mean, she gets up at 1 o'clock in the morning, just can't go back to sleep. People all over the world are trying to make sense of this, and I think it's hard for everyone, kids and grown-ups alike, don't really understand why this would happen. What do you think of it when you try to understand it? I think that these people just took my dad away from us for like no good reason. I don't know why, like if they met him, I, I know that they changed their mind. They just went and there were these loving people and then they just had to take them away. So that's what I feel of it. So many taken away in an instant. This weekend at Arlington National Cemetery, Tyler and Kelsey Williams said goodbye to their dad, U.S. Army Major Dwayne Williams. I was proud of what he did, but then again, it was like I just wanted to see his face one last time. The Williams moved to the Washington area with their father and mother, Tammy, just three months ago. Dwayne had a new job at the Pentagon. When their father didn't come home that evening, 13-year-old Kelsey and Tyler, 17, began to write about their dad. I feel the pain of my father on my heart. I touch my father's face as if he were beside me. I couldn't picture life without you, and now it's here. It's like the devil looked in my mind and picked my worst fear. I say to myself that he is alive. I dream that he is walking through the door of my house and saying that he is okay. I let mom lean on me because now I stand in your shoes. I don't know how you did it, but we got us through. Now when you look down at me, there's an image of you. Now when you look down at me, there's the image of you. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. A lot of boys, suddenly young men, see the image of their father in themselves. 
Mike Shaw is 16, now helping to take care of his sister, Nicole, and his mother, Debbie. Now I come home every day after school to make sure that my mom's okay here. So I go in and check on my sister to make sure she's okay. Things that my dad would have done. His dad, Jeff, was an electrician in the World Trade Center. Jeff knew every inch of those towers, and he loved them. When the first plane hit, Debbie called his cell phone. He told her that it was really dark. He couldn't see in front of him. It was just a lot of smoke and just didn't look good. A couple of minutes later, after the second plane hit, she called him back. But all my mom heard was him just running. He was out of breath, and he was saying, bye, bye, I love you, bye. It has been more than a month now, and you're still calling his cell phone. Yeah, we have his cell phone still connected, so when we call, we could just hear his voice and then leave a message at the end of the night. I like to call him before I go to bed. It's my way to kind of have a conversation with him for that day. Your sister's been calling, too. Yeah, she calls a lot. She likes to talk to him. What do you say to him? Um, I just, whatever went on that day, I tell him what I did in school, what I did after school, that what we have for dinner. I wish he was here with us for dinner, that I miss him, and wherever he is, I hope that he's doing okay. We're playing for the district championship. It's second and third. There's one out, and Brendan's up at bat. And Brendan Regan, no doubt, would tell his fallen father about this. New York has their bravest, and Floral Park has their bravest, and our bravest, the way he's conducted himself, is Brendan Regan. Saturday, his Little League team got the award for winning last summer's district championship. That game was in July, and his dad, New York firefighter Bobby Regan, was coaching. Brendan got the hit that won the game. Brendan, he was at that game. Yeah, he was keeping the score. Got a single? Yeah. Drove the man on third home? Yeah. Won then, the championship? Yeah. What did your dad think of that? He, well, first, like, everyone came over and, like, tackled me and everything, and then he came out and tried to look for me, and only, like... He couldn't find me. He must have been thrilled. What did he say to you? <sighs> nice hit. <laughs> nice hit. If you could say anything to your dad now, what would it be? We have practice tonight. Lieutenant Bobby Regan left behind his wife of 21 years, Donna, 12-year-old Brendan, and his 16-year-old daughter, Caitlin. I'm just really happy that he's around because I noticed that, like, a lot of my friends' dads, like, they work into the night and I was always really thankful that my dad was around a lot, and he spent a lot of time with us. Caitlin and Brendan's dad, Lieutenant Regan, was charging into the World Trade Center about the same time that Chuck Zion was likely helping his colleagues get out. Zachary is his 18-year-old son. He had been there in 93 when the building had been attacked the last time, and it took almost three hours for them to get down from up at the 104th, maybe over three hours. And um, when I saw the building actually collapse, I... I knew that, um, that it was really unlikely that any, um, any of them made it out because 90 minutes to get down 104 floors is just not enough. Chuck loved cooking, football, and golf. He was a senior vice president at the financial firm Cantor Fitzgerald, and Zach intends to follow him there. How is your America going to be different from your father's America? I think that people have realized what a special place this is, about how lucky they are to be here and what special values that America represents. But it's not something that you just get for free. It's something that, you know, you have to fight for, literally. Chuck Zion leaves behind his wife of 20 years, Carol, and Zach, their only child. I'm just grateful that I got as much time as I did. You know, there are a lot of kids that are left behind that, you know, won't have known their parents the way I got to know mine. I was, 
at least lucky enough to realize what a wonderful man my dad was before he left and really admire him. But Frank Spinelli's younger kids did not know their dad quite as long. I always that knew, thought that he was going to be there. I never thought this was going to happen. It just all happened in a matter of minutes. And of course, there were tons of things that I hadn't learned from him and hadn't been with him long enough. And uh, I really lost a lot of key years of my life with him. I think all of us assume that we're always going to have our parents. Is there anything that was left unsaid or anything that you'd wished you'd done? Um, you just always thought you'd have the time. Yeah, I mean, there's certain things that you just always expect. You expect your dad to be there on your high school graduation. You expect your dad to be there to walk you down the aisle. You expect your dad to be there for, you know, your grandkids and just there to teach you his life lessons that he had already learned. And sometimes I just remember what things that he's taught me. The other day I was mowing the lawn and I forgot how to, uh, how it wasn't turning on, so I just remembered something that he told me and <laughs> did it and it turned on and worked perfectly, so. The mower? Yeah. If you had an opportunity to say something to your dad, what would it be? It's really hard. After this, uh, you look back and you realize that you're never again going to be able to call someone dad again. And just to call someone by the name dad would just be the one thing that I would want. Um, I would just like to say, dad, I love you. I really wish that that night that he'd come home from work, still here, alive, and just come in and kiss me. Like, I'd always, whenever I heard the door open, I'd run, jump, jump and give him a kiss, and I just miss that. A birthday cake, a cell phone message, the look of the smile, the crack of the bat. The children of September wrap themselves in a fabric of memories against the cold of a love lost too soon. No single family suffered a greater loss on September 11th than the family that is the fire department of the city of New York. More than 300 firefighters died in the line of duty, died heroes. The responsibility for making sure each and every one was accorded the honors due a hero fell to a band of brothers. 343 New York City firemen died under the rubble of the World Trade Center. But a New York City Fire Department tradition is living on, stronger than ever, and more significant than anyone could have imagined. For 40 years, a small band of brothers, full-time firefighters, and part-time musicians have performed at the department occasions. The happy and the sad, the weddings, the parades, and every once in a while, the funerals. But since September 11th, every once in a while has become every day and on some days, every few hours. By the time we share our Thanksgiving dinners, the band will have played at about 300 services. The snare of drums and the bellowing of bagpipes has been echoing in the canyons and suburbs of New York City ever since September 11th. We played at many other funerals over the years, but this has been just, uh, it's like almost every day. When you go from one to the next to the next, and it's, it's the same, you never get used to it. The 70 members of the New York City Fire Department Emerald Society Pipes and Drums have hung up their firemen's helmets and donned kilts full time. I've played more in six weeks, buried more guys in six weeks than I've done in 23 years of firefighter. But they know burying them all is not likely. Only a few firemen in these ruins have been identified. For most, this will be their final burial ground. For those who are found, there are funerals. For the rest, memorial services. And the band will be there for all of them. The men plan to be playing at churches beyond Christmas. I love this job uh, so much. Jimmy Genty is a founding member of the Pipes and Drums. Like several others, Genty is retired from the fire department, but not from the band. 
it, it's, it's something that we have to do and we want to do uh, because of the great loss and, and the brotherhood in the job. Brian Grogan has spent 20 years with the department, 16, as a bagpiper. Before September 11th, you played funerals, you played memorial services, but thanks to God, there weren't that many. After September 11th, it's been constant. What's that like? Reminds me of that movie, uh, Groundhog's Day, when every day just doesn't stop. Has there been a morning where you just said to yourself, I want to do this, but I just can't do it. I can't do it today? Every morning. Every morning I say it, but I get up and I go. Tim Grant is leader of the band. A lot of people, they lose a family member or they lose a friend. Maybe, a, maybe it might have been a, a young person, an old person, grand, grandfather or something like that. It's usually one, one person, one at a time, you know? So everybody here knows 20, 30 people. When do you ever in your life lose that many people in one day that you know? It is routine to have 10 services a day. One Saturday, there were 21. The band often is spread so thin that only a few players can show up at each service. Tom McEnroe remembers doing four in one day. We started at 10 o'clock in the morning, we did a 10, a one, a four, and a seven o'clock at night. Many days, the men travel hundreds of miles, driving from church to church, to places like the Bronx, where Sean Talon was mourned. Talon was a trainee, two weeks short of his 27th birthday, single, a former U.S. Marine. But more often, the pipers and drummers find themselves playing miles from the city, in the suburbs, where most firemen and their families now live. On this day, it was Battalion Chief Joseph Marchbanks turn to be memorialized. He had served 22 years and left behind a 14-year-old daughter, Lauren, an eight-year-old son, Ryan, and his wife, Teresa. Any of us who've been through a memorial service or a funeral for a loved one, particularly mm -hmm. someone as close as a husband, mm -hmm. there are times when you don't even hear what's happening around you. Yeah, you're right. Uh, did that happen today when the bagpipes were playing? No, not at all. When they, when they folded the flag, they had the honor guards doing that. It was, uh, and they played, and I heard everything. What Teresa Marchbanks heard best and loved most was the final farewell. They always line up in the same formation and these days play the same song. I could have rode like that for a couple miles because I didn't want it to end. Yeah, I didn't want it to end. For Pipers, this is a heartbreaking moment. We're always right in front of the church. They're coming out of limousines. You see the wife, you see the children, and firemen seem to always have a lot of children. And uh, everybody's like lost and hurt, and you're standing right there. You can't, you can't look at the children, even the wife. You got to look away, because otherwise it'll tear you apart, really tear you apart. You never get that. Uh, you never walk away from it. It's still a twist in the stomach and choke in the throat, and tear in your eye. No matter what, you think you would get hard to it, but you don't. But no matter how hard it is to play in front of the church, there is one period even tougher. And it's the one thing they try to avoid. It's what Bill Duffy talked about while waiting for a service to end. You'll notice a lot of guys in the band aren't going into the churches. Uh, I only go in if I really knew the guy. Um, because 
it's just too much. It's, it's just too much emotionally to bear to do that. But several days later, every single member of the band came prepared to do just that. For their beloved drummer, their only member to die at the World Trade Center. Darrell Pearsall was 30 years old. Everyone called him Bronco. He left no parents, no wife, no children. The band was his family, and they gathered, as they say, to pipe him to heaven. Usually one lone piper plays Amazing Grace. Not today. For Bronco, there was a symphony. And when the playing stopped, they all carried their instruments and their love through the church doors. But this is not the end of the story. Life for the band, as for the rest of us, is slowly returning to normal. With every week, there are fewer funerals now, fewer endings, and more beginnings. Only two weeks ago, Brian Grogan got a taste of that himself. You may remember Grogan felt like he was living in the movie Groundhog Day with funeral after funeral after funeral. But not this night. It was his daughter's wedding, and the men from the Emerald Society were there, playing a different tune, making at last a joyful noise. This was one day Grogan hoped would never end. You know, it sets aside what, what I've been through and what the rest of the fire department's been through and the rest of the world's been through. This is the greatest feeling in the world. September 11th, 2001 a day we will never forget as long as we live. An unprovoked sneak attack on America, the slaughter of so many innocents, but also a rebirth of the American spirit witnessed in the bravery of rescue workers and ordinary citizens, selfless acts of kindness, neighbor helping neighbor. Terrorists set out to destroy America's freedom, but succeeded only in renewing American resolve to defend it, whatever the cost. That is what we saw.